section, uh, section 2.4, and I'm going to call this uh, Introduction to Proofs. And we've talked a little bit, just a little bit of, I just want to give a little bit of background of why, again, why we're doing proofs, why we're talking about proofs in geometry, and why we're doing it now. So we've mentioned several times Euclid and how he wrote these, these books, The Elements, that uh, really were organized, organized um, geometry, organized what we knew about math in a systematic way using logic. And what Euclid did was he started with five postulates and 23 definitions. So basically 28 pieces of information. And using logic, using the what we've been talking about, if and then, and converses, and valid arguments and invalid arguments, using what he knew about all of those things, he put together everything, basically everything that we know about, about geometry. Um, so starting with 28 pieces of information and putting together all the stuff that we know about geometry is pretty impressive. Um, and like I said, he, he used logic to do that. So what, what we're doing is we're, we're starting to learn how, how we make a logical argument in math, how we can put together what we know to come up with new information or to solve a problem. Uh, it's exactly the way we went about solving our college trick problem, where we said, we know this, so we have to go here on this day. We know this, so we have to go here on that day. And, and we went from, went from there. <clears throat> uh, working this way is a little different than, than the way we worked with math before. It's not like algebra where we say to solve this kind of problem you do this, 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 and then you're done. It's a little more abstract. It requires a little more, um, a little more kind of organization, a little more thinking, thinking on your own. There's not a step-by-step -step way to do it. So it can be a little bit challenging. And at first, it, it, it can seem a little confusing. What I'm going to say is, if it seems confusing at first, it's, it's OK. We'll keep working on it. We'll, we're taking small steps. And eventually, it will start making more sense. But uh, it's not something that you can say, I totally don't get this, and then just stop. It, it might be confusing for a little bit, but we keep working on it. So, and, it's, and it's OK. You guys didn't learn how to do, you didn't learn how to solve equations in algebra in one lesson. It took a while. And it's going to be the same thing with, with proofs in geometry. So what we're going to start with today is basically a list, list of rules. And the rules are for are, are rules that we use to solve equations. We use them to solve equations in algebra all the time. We just never thought of them as rules. We use them without even thinking about them. So as our first first step into, <coughs> into doing proofs, we're going to talk about the rules that, that allow us to solve equations the way we do. And the list of rules is, is kind of like in our college trip project, is kind of like the flights and the schedules for the meetings. Those are the rules that we had to follow. We had to fit within those guidelines to do our trip. So these, these rules are like our schedule. They're, they're the guidelines that we have to follow. And we're just, today we're going to start writing those rules down and then in some of the problems, we'll say, this particular rule tells me I can do this. That's really what we're, what we're doing. So the first, our first set are called the algebraic properties of equality. It's not particularly important that you remember that they're called the algebraic properties of equality. I just want you to at least have seen, to, to understand that we're talking about what, what we're talking about, that, that what we're talking about has a, a specific name. Now the properties we will have to remember, but they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward. The first one is the addition property. And the addition property says that if we have an equation, then we can add some number, we can add something to both sides. So this is just the rule that tells us that we can add something to both sides of an equation. And oftentimes you guys do these properties without thinking yep. that they have a name. Right, we just do them. 
We, we add something to both sides, we subtract to get, to get x by itself, we subtract from both sides of the equation. So we're going to talk about all those properties that we use without thinking about them and just give them a name. Now, a lot of times we also don't use the word property every time. We just say addition, subtraction, and that, that's okay. So our next one is subtraction. And again, if we have a, an equation, we can subtract something from both sides. Again, something that we do all the time. We're just giving, giving the rule a name. The next one, you can probably guess, is the multiplication property. And it tells us we can multiply both sides of an equation by something. Next one, division. We can divide both sides of an equation. And we want to make sure that we don't divide by zero. So we're going to say C can't equal zero. So we can't divide by zero. That gives us problems. And then we have one more that we use that is called substitution. And substitution says that if A equals B, we can replace A with B in an equation. And we usually call substitution, what we usually call it is plugging in. That's usually what we call substitution. So for example, on our test, we, we had a problem where we solved for x. We found that x was 17.5. And the thing we were looking for was 6x. So we plugged in 17.5 for x and multiply it by 6. That plugging in is substituted. We substituted 17.5 for x. So we plugged it in. That's, that's what substitution means. So these are all the things that we use all the time to solve equations in algebra. We're just giving them a name. And when we start working on proofs, the first proofs that we're going to work on are just going to be, if, if, they, if you're given the steps of solving an equation, what property tells you you can do that particular step? So if you're adding something to both sides, you say the addition property that tells you to do that. If you're dividing both sides of the equation by some something, you say the division property tells you to do that. So that's, that's what we're doing with these properties. So questions on these? We, we, have, we have a few more that we're going to talk about, and then we'll actually use some of them to do, do I'll do a proof just to show you how we use them. All right, so these are our algebraic properties. We have some properties called equivalence properties. So our equivalence properties have, have some, uh, some different names. The first one is reflexive property. The reflexive properties tells us that a number equals itself. A equals A. Our next one is the symmetric property. And that tells us that I can compare numbers in, in any order. If A equals B, then B equals A. And these properties, they seem like that, how could they be different? They seem like they're common sense. 
It turns out that if you if you look at uh, numbers or a sy system of numbers where these properties don't hold, then different things happen, interesting, interesting things happen. But for what we're doing, these properties are true. And the last one, our last equivalence property, is the transitive property. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So we're just comparing things kind of in a chain. We're going from one to the next and getting to getting from the beginning to the end. And we put together logical chains this way also. So it just lets us compare things one after the next. And I kind of think of the properties, all of these properties that we're talking about, they're kind of like they're kind of like a hammer. They're kind of like a tool. It's not necessarily not necessarily that the tool itself, that the hammer is cool. It's not a fancy hammer, but it's what you do with the hammer that ends up being cool. It's what you can use these properties for. So, so the hammer is not necessarily some high-tech fancy hammer. This is just a tool that we're using. It's what we do with the tool that ends up being interesting. All right, so these are our equivalence properties. This is for comparing numbers. We talked in the chapter one about comparing shapes. What term did we use when we talked about comparing shapes? We didn't say shapes were equal, we said what? How do we compare angles or segments? Congruent. We said they were congruent. Perfect. So when we're talking about shapes or figures, we have some congruence properties. So the congruence properties just let us compare shapes and figures rather than numbers. These are all these all have to do with numbers. So the congruence properties let us compare shapes and figures. So I'm going to say for this, A and B are shapes. And the other word we use for shapes a lot is figures. And the congruence properties are exactly the same as the equivalence properties. We have the reflexive. And that just says a shape is congruent to itself. Any shape is exactly the same size and shape as itself. It would be a strange world if that weren't true. We have the symmetric property. And that the symmetric property just tells us we can compare shapes in any order. If A is congruent to B, then B is congruent to A. So we can compare them in any order. We don't have to put them in a particular order to compare them. And then we have the transitive property that just says we can compare them in a sequence. I uh, don't I need if twice. If A is congruent to B, and B is congruent to C, then A is congruent to C. So we can compare them one after the next in a chain. And that's a transitive property. So we have our algebraic properties that are the rules that tell us how we why we can solve equations the way we do. We have our equivalence properties that tell us how we compare two numbers to each other. And we have our congruence properties that tell us how we can compare two shapes or figures. Or in the case of the transit property, more than more than two, <coughs> one after the next.
So questions on our properties. These are the very first ones that we're going to use to start doing proofs. All right, so let's use some of these properties to prove our first theorem. So a theorem is just something that we that we proved using logic. It's some some statement, some fact that we proved with logic. That's what we call a theorem. So here is our setup for our theorem. We have a segment here. And we know that AB equals CD. So this segment and that segment are the same length. They're congruent. We're going to prove that AC equals BD. So we know that these two small pieces on the ends are congruent. We're going to prove that that long piece is equal to that long piece. So if we think about this, if we look at this, what it's telling us, if I have AB to get to all the way over here to C, what do I have to add on to segment AB? I'm here at segment AB, what do I have to add to get over here to C? From here, what do I have to add to get here? What part, what part of the segment am I adding? If I have this, what part am I adding to get over to C? A, B plus B, C. I'm just adding this middle part. That's perfect. So let's, let's write that A, C, we know that we can add pieces of segments. Because in chapter 1, we talked about the segment addition postulate. So we're going to write AC as the two pieces added together. So AC equals AB plus BC. That's the first part. Now, if we have CD, if we have this part, what do we have to add? To get all the way over here to B. What are we adding there? We're adding CD and BC. We're just adding this middle part again. So let's write that BD, that's the other thing we're interested in, equals CD plus BC. And I want to write the rule that tells me I can do that. That is by the segment addition postulate tells me that, that we can do that. So the segment addition postulate tells me that I can add those pieces together. So this is, this is how we do a proof. I'm saying this is what I'm doing and this is why I can do it. All right, we know from up here the problem tells us AB equals CD. So I'm going to take, since these two are equal, I can substitute one of these in for the thing that's equal to in an equation. So I'm going to take AB, here is AB, it equals CD, I'm going to substitute it right here. So I'm going to write this again, AC equals AB 
plus BC. Now I'm going to write this equation with AB substituted in here for CD. They're, they're the same thing. They equal the same number, so I can put it in that equation. So BD equals AB plus BC. And what tells me I can do that is substitution. So I use substitution there. Now what can we see about these, these two things? They're the same. So let me use my highlighter again. These two are the same. This is the same as that. So since those two are the same, what do we know about AC and BD? If AC equals 7 and BD equals 7, what can we say about AC and BD? that they're equal. They're also the same. So AC equals BD. And I could say that I substituted BD here because this is the same thing. And that is <coughs> substitution tells me that I can put BD over here for this thing that's the same. So there's my proof. I started with the segment addition postulate. I used substitution to substitute into my equation. And I came up with something that was the same. That's, in a nutshell, how we do proofs. Now, when you guys, when you guys first start doing them, you're not going to have to come up with everything on your own. They'll, the proofs will be laid out. And you might have to add a reason for this particular step. But they'll have a step written down for you. You might have to tell what the next step is, but the reason will be written down for you. So we're just going to, we're going to start out slowly with this. You're not going to have to invent this stuff all on your own. But this is an example of how we're going to use these properties. We use the segment addition postulate that we already knew. We use substitution twice. And that's, that's how we did this proof. To get from this idea to what we were interested in. So we're just making an argument and giving the reasons for our argument. So this theorem that we proved has a special name. So we've just proved a, a theorem that has a special name in our book. This is called the overlapping. Does this have two P's? Segment theorem. So this is a special theorem that we're going to give a name. So we just proved the overlapping, one part of the overlapping segment theorem. So let's write down what the overlapping segment theorem tells us, and then we'll do a couple of examples. So the overlapping segment theorem has two parts. If AB equals CD, this is the part that we just proved, then AC equals BD. And the converse is also true. If AC equals BD, then AB equals CD. And I'm going to highlight the parts that overlap. The reason they call it the overlapping segment theorem is we have a segment that goes from there to there. And the segment that goes from there to there. And the reason this works is because they both share this part in the middle. That's where they overlap. They both share that part in the middle. So that's why it's called the overlapping segment theorem. So we just proved this, this first part, and we would do something very similar to prove the second part. Questions on, questions on this? All right, let's look at a couple of examples of how we would use the overlapping segment theorem. We'll start with a couple of easy ones, and then we'll do a couple more complicated ones or one more complicated one.
All right, so we have our segment is laid out like this. And we'll call it W, X, Y, Z this time. And the problem tells us that W, X equals Y, Z. So we know that this, this part and that part are congruent. So this looks like our setup for the overlapping segment theorem. The problem also tells us that WX equals 8. So let's label that part. WX equals 8. Now if these parts are congruent, what does YZ equal? 8. eight. It also has to equal 8. They're congruent. And it tells us that WY, this piece, is 19. So that's the parts, those are the parts that we know. Now let's, we can do this two different ways. Let's think about what this is telling us. If this part is 19, this whole segment, and this piece of it is 8, what does this middle piece have to be? What is it? 11. It has to be 11. 11 plus 8 is 19. So this piece has to be 11. 8 plus 11 gives us 19. So if the problem asks us what is xz? So from x to z, how far is it from here to here? 19. 11 plus 8. xz equals 19. 11 plus 8. So this is what the overlapping segment theorem is telling us. We're just adding this part. They both, both pieces share this piece in the middle. We also could have looked at this and said, oh, those two are congruent. This is the overlapping segment theorem. So this piece has to be the same as XZ. We would know that right away because we proved that theorem. But we can also just put our numbers in here and figure it out. So let's look at another example, another easy one. And then we'll do one that's a little more complicated. So we have W, X, Y, and Z again. This time the problem tells us that W, Y equals X, Z. So the longer pieces are congruent. Uh, and it says that W, X is 30. So this piece is 30, and WY is 75. So that whole piece is 75. So if this whole thing is 75 and this is 30, how big does this middle piece have to be? 45. Now, the problem asks us for um, it tells us that WY equals XZ. So here's XZ. Those two are equal. WY equals XZ. So how big is XZ? 75. Well, that whole thing is 75, and this part is 45. How big is this part? 30. It has to be 30. So we know that um, YZ, if they ask us that, we would know that YZ equals 30. So this is all the overlapping segment theorem tells us. If we know that these two are the same, they share this middle piece, so these end pieces have to be the same. Questions on that? All right, let's do one that's a little more complicated. And then we, we're very close to being done now. Um, so for this one, we don't have nice, nice numbers. We have to use algebra.
This one it says WX equals YZ. Um, WY is 9. So let's label that. WY is 9. The problem tells us that XY is 2B plus 1. So this part is 2B plus 1. And YZ is B squared. So we're going to label this B squared. We want to find B and we're going to say let's find B and XY. So the problem tells us that WX equals YZ. So YZ is B squared. So what does WX also have to equal? B squared. It's also equal to B squared. If this whole thing is 9, this whole segment is 9, these two pieces have to add up to give me 9. So that's going to be my equation that I work with. I can write B squared plus 2B plus 1 equals 9. So I've just added this part to this part to get this whole thing. Now this is where we have to be careful. When I have a b squared and I have a b, how do I have to solve this equation? Yeah? <coughs> Alright, so we, you, you say subtract 1, but then I have a b squared and a b. So I have, I have b's in two places. So there's a special rule that we use when we have a b squared. Does anybody remember? Corey? Well, this, so the second b is to the first power. Um, well, because b is the, to the first power, then we don't have like terms. So this, this is a special, a special way that we have to solve this. Mm, close, you're, you're on the right track. So what we do when we have a squared is we want to get everything on one side and a zero on the other. So I'm going to subtract 9. So I have b squared plus 2b minus 8 equals 0. Now does anybody remember how we how we solve these kinds of equations, where we have a b squared, a 2b, 8, and this equals 0. Divide 8 by 2. Uh, if we divide 8 by 2, we'd have to also divide the b squared by 2. So we're, we're thinking back back to Algebra 1. It was, it was a while ago. We have to factor. Um, you probably learned lots, of, you may have learned different ways to factor. You can cross and box. Um, there, there are other ways. I honestly, I never learned any of those fancy ways to factor. So I always do it, but just the old-fashioned way, setting up the parentheses. But so one way or the other, we have to factor this. And by factor, we end up with. I mean, we end up with two parentheses, and that equals zero. I have a b here and a b here. And the way I always do it, just the old-fashioned way, is I need two numbers that multiply to negative eight and then add to 2. So what two numbers multiply to 8? 2 and 4. So I'm going to put a 2 here and a 4 there. They have to multiply to negative 8 and add to 2. So I'm going to do a minus 2 and a plus 4. So basically I'm undoing FOIL here. This is called factoring. So just a kind of reminder to help jog your memory. When I have a b squared, I have to factor. And by factor, I, I end up with two parentheses. And the reason I'm doing this problem now is because we're going to come across problems where we have to factor in geometry. So I want to start, start us remembering about factoring so that we can solve those problems when we get to them. <coughs> All right, now I have these two parentheses. Now I break this into two problems. b minus 2 equals 0 or 
b plus 4 equals 0. I add 2, I get b equals 2, or I subtract 4, I get b equals negative 4. Last year, some of your teachers could have called this t and two. Oh, t. Right. So I. So from here, this is this is my t. Right. So you, Miss Miss Linger, can help remind me of those terms because I the way I learned it is just kind of the old-fashioned way. And many of you for the factor in part two might have seen that cross or what it multiplies to on top and what it adds to on the bottom. So you did the factors on the bottom. Oh, so you did it. So you did it this way, mm -hmm. and we had a negative. Four and a two. You have a negative eight on top, two on the bottom, and you put your oh, factors on the left and the right. Negative eight and a two. They have to add two, and then you figure out what two numbers yeah. multiply to this and add to that. So that's how I we know get many our. Of the algebra teachers left their time talking about it, but it truly is about what works for you. Right. I I I always forget these little tricks. So so when people ask me about them, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I kind of remember that. Um, so we got we have two answers here. So we found B, and we want to find X Y this segment in the middle. Let's look at this B equals negative four first. If I plug in, if I substitute negative four in for B, two times negative four is what? Negative eight plus one is negative seven. Does it make sense to have a segment with a negative seven length? No. So we're going to cross that one out. We're going to throw that one away. So it doesn't make sense. So b equals 2. And 2 times 2 plus 1 equals 5. And xy equals 5. So using our overlapping segment theorem, we figured out the b was 2 and xy was 5. All right. One, one last thing I have to talk about, and then we're done. And this one's pretty short. So we have the overlapping segment theorem. We also have an overlapping angle theorem. This is the part that we would have normally done on a second day, but it's pretty short. This, the stuff that we're talking about today is not on the quiz, okay? So the overlapping angle theorem, exact same idea as overlapping segments, it just has to do with angles. So let's draw some angles here. And we're not going to go through all the process of uh, figuring out, of, of proving it, we're just going to say what it tells us. Because the ideas are really the same. So there are my angles. The overlapping angle theorem says two things, just like the overlapping segment theorem. If angle AOB, this small one here, is congruent to angle COD, this small one here, then angle AOC is congruent to angle BOD. So the bigger angle here is then congruent to angle the bigger angle there. And it's the same idea. We have these two small pieces on the edge. The bigger angles both share this big piece in the middle. And the converse is also true. We, we turn it around. If angle AOC is congruent to angle BOD, then angle AOB the smaller angles are congruent. So it looks just like the overlapping segment theorem. It just has to do with angles. 
it tells us the exact same thing. So to find this big angle here, AOC, I add this piece to this piece. I'm adding two smaller pieces to get the bigger piece. Because the bigger angles share this piece in the middle, that makes sure that the ones on the sides are congruent and the bigger angles are congruent. And let's draw, I'm just going to draw a picture with some numbers in it to show why this works. Sometimes seeing it with numbers helps us, helps us visualize what it's telling us. So here are my angles. If I know that this is 30 degrees, and that angle is 30 degrees, and that angle is 50 degrees. How big then is the angle from there to there? 80. It's 50 plus 30. That angle is 80 degrees. And if this is 50 and this is 30, how big is that angle there? It's also 80. That's all the overlapping angle theorem tells us. These two are the same, so these two bigger angles have to be the same because they share this one in the middle. If these two bigger angles are the same, then the smaller angles on the outside are the same because they share that angle in the middle. That's all it's telling us. Questions on overlapping angles? All right. This next piece is not, not uh, part of the notes. I just want you to know, know this so when you see it in, in the book, you understand what they're saying. They talk about two different kinds of proofs in our book. Um, they talk about two column. And for two column proofs, all that means is we're making a, a chart like this and we put our statements on one side and our reasons on the other side. So this is how we did our, our college trip. We said we're going here on Monday and our reason is we caught a flight from here to here at this time. So when they talk about a two column proof, they just mean this. And a paragraph proof, paragraph just means write in sentences. So when you come across problems, they'll say something about a two-column proof, or they'll say something about a paragraph proof. This is what they're talking about. <coughs> so the proof that we did for the overlapping segment theorem was more like a paragraph proof. I kind of wrote in, in sentences what we were saying. All right. Our marathon of notes is done.